Good afternoon. Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a webinar series where we help you create a green thumb. And today we have a lovely speaker. You're going to be wowed with her engagement and her images. And if you come downtown to Washington, D.C., you'll be wowed by her garden as well. So, my name is Cindy Brown. I'm the Education Manager, and Janet Draper is our speaker today. As always, please put your questions in the chat box. We'll get to as many of them at the end as we possibly can. We're also going to put the names of the plants uh, that she's going to be speaking about in the chat box, so you'll be able to copy them down. And this video will appear on our website in about two weeks. So you'll be able to review the webinar at that point. So Janet Draper, horticulturist, who is tending the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden at Smithsonian Gardens, will you engage us with your dozen of wonderful plants that you include in your garden. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Cindy. It, it's always a pleasure to, to share my love of, of horticulture with everyone. And uh, especially today, uh, my mom is on this webinar. So hi, mom. Anyway, let's get going. Um, for those of you that don't know the Ripley Garden, uh, it is a tiny little third of an acre space wedged between the Arts and Industries Building and the Hirshhorn Museum, right on the National Mall. And this is a fantastic space, and I feel like I'm the luckiest of all the gardeners at Smithsonian because it's got raised beds and meandering, a little brick meandering pathway, and just little vignettes, and it's a stroll garden where people, you know, they take their time and they look at the individual plants. So I want something happening every season of the year, if not every day, because, you know, I'm in there too, and I, I want to see something new and something fresh. So the garden is constantly evolving and changing, and, and literally at this time of the year, every day is some, something new is coming out. And my goal is to show people plants that they can grow in their own garden or just the diversity of mother nature. And there are a lot of things that are just absolutely glorious, like this peony that is beautiful for about 12 hours it always seems like because you know it always rains or hails or winds when the winds are strong when the peonies are in bloom so to create a garden that has a longer season you need to think about different things uh, here's another peony i adore this is uh peony bartzella the ito peony it's a hybrid between a normal herbaceous peony and a tree peony. So it's the best of both parents. But again, it only blooms for maybe a week. Um, so a week, I, I mean, a week in a garden, you know, what, what does the plant do the other 52 or 51 weeks of the year? So I'm looking for plants that can help bridge from day to day to week to week so that there's something interesting to look at in the garden uh, every day of the year. So let, let's get some basic definitions down here. Uh, this, this whole talk um, is about perennials that I grow in Washington, D.C., which is a zone 7B. We're almost pushing an 8 because of the heat of the city, we are in a heat sink and DC is known for a lot of hot air. So um, I'm, I'm working, I'm talking about plants for my zone. Um, I don't know where you are, so I can't speak on your zone. So basic definition, 
An annual is a plant that completes its entire life cycle in one growing season. A biennial is one that can take two growing seasons to complete its life cycle. And a perennial is one that takes more than one season to complete its life, set, life uh, cycle. And often a perennial, I think they're smarter than annuals because they save up energy to come back next year. So their bloom time is shorter. But let me clarify, a perennial is not synonymous with perpetual. Just like humans, some of us have longer genetics and will live to be 100, and others, our genetics aren't as, as strong, and we might kick off a little earlier. Uh, perennials are the same way. Something like a peony can live for decades, but something like a coneflower or an echinacea might only live three years before it self sows and the mother plant will pass, uh, will die out. So just remember, perennial is not perpetual. If you want a perpetual plant, look into plastic. Sorry, that was that was pretty snide, but uh, it's the truth. Uh, so uh, again, that those are the various definitions. And again, the, the plants I'm talking about are workhorses for the DC metro area. So let's get into it. Uh, my first group of plants that I absolutely cannot garden without are hellebores. Uh, hellebores or Lenten roses, Christmas roses. These are so exquisite. Um, yeah, they start blooming in the middle of the winter for us. They push up through the snow. They're fantastic. Hellebores fetidus is one of my absolute all-time favorite plants. The poor thing having such a horrible Latin name, fetid, meaning stinking. So it's known as the stinking hellebore. At, at this poor thing, it, it is a beauty. If you pick the flower and bring into the house, yeah, it does have a little bit of a, a little funk to the flower, but this is not a plant that you normally pick and bring in. Um, if you leave it out in the garden, it'll look good for about two, two and a half months. Uh, I think Hellebores fetidus has beautiful uh, cutly foliage and the green bells that hang down and often are rimmed in raspberry. Um, other hellebores, that the hybrids right now of hellebores are amazing from yellows to whites, to greens, to pinks, and they, they call them red. They're not, they're burgundy, there's some black. Oh my gosh, they're awesome. And what, what the hybridizers are trying to do, and for, by the way, for us here in DC, hellebores are perfectly evergreen and they bloom starting December through March, some, sometime in there. Uh, this is a stand of old fashioned hellebores or hellebores hybridus. And you notice the flowers hang downward. And to really see the flower, you have to turn the flower up to look, look at the flower. What the hybridizers are doing is doing breeding for outwardly facing flowers. So you don't have to get down on your hands and knees to see the flowers. They, they will look out at you. The flowers will never be upward facing because the pollen would be ruined with an upward facing flower. So outward facing, and they're also doing amazing breeding work to have beautiful foliage. Look at the foliage here on pink frost. So um, part of the breeding work is beautiful foliage and flowers that are held above that foliage. Because with the old fashioned hellebore, let's go back to these, what I will do is go in and I will cut all of the foliage off, last year's foliage, before they bloom. Otherwise, the flowers are often um, 
hidden down in that old foliage. And if it if you've had a bad winter, it looks a little ratty and you know just unkempt. So you can go in with a lawnmower or a hedge trimmer or something like that and just shear them all off uh, about four inches from the ground so that you do not hit those newly emerging buds. And then you'll have the flowers and foliage come up and be just exquisite. Uh, but with the newer cultivars, the foliage usually for me will look good going into the spring. So you don't even have to cut the foliage off. Uh, and the colors, oh my God, they're so beautiful. I love this one from Pine Knot Nursery down in, in uh, Southern Virginia. Even the foliage has a chartreuse tinge to it. Oh, just beautiful. I'm not speaking on the specific hybrids here because there are too many beautiful ones to choose from. Um, when you buy a hellebore, it will be expensive because they're slow growing and just get better with age, just like all of us. Um, and you really don't need to divide these or do anything to them. So uh, here's Glinda's gloss in the Ripley garden. Look at that foliage. It's just gorgeous. So even when the plant is not in flower, it still is, is uh holding a good it it um uh, it's still contributing to the garden so foliage is just as important as flower to me so all right and here's that same stand of of the hellebores the hellebores hybridus a little while later uh if you look really closely the older flowers are hanging down below and you've got all that fresh foliage that's up um, uh, what I did yesterday out in the garden is I went in and cut back all of those old flowers because I don't want more seedlings. Um, hybridus will self-sow um, quite abundantly. So if you have enough hellebores, you go in and cut the flowers off before the seeds all drop. If you want more, um, some of the hybrids are sterile, but others will give you give you babies. So yeah, so my maintenance for hellebores for the year, I cut them down. Um, I remove all the tattered foliage before they flower. And after flowering, if I don't want any more, I'll cut off the old flower heads. That's the maintenance for the year. Uh, shade plant, handles dry shade once established, uh, plant them in the spring or in the fall, don't plant in the middle of the summer, you know, summer heat, we're all stressed in summer heat. So hellebores, oh, a great plant family. So explore the entire family. Next plant family I'm looking at are euphorbias. Uh, euphorbias are the same family as, well, cacti, and also poinsettias are in the euphorbia family, which is really cool. But my favorite, and if you come to the Ripley right now, uh, euphorbia cheriacus subspecies wolfinii is in bloom. It's a Mediterranean plant that thus, you know, um, general rule of thumb with, with plants, if they have silvery gray foliage, they're coming from an area with a lot of sun. And so that's like mother nature's sunscreen where the plant doesn't need all of that sun so it reflects part of it off. So silver gray usually will tell you this plant wants full sun and it wants well-drained soils. So Euphorbia wolfinii, I mean, those, those heads, uh, they're actually modified leaves and bracts, uh, they can be the size of my head. There's just so cool. Here's another euphorbia used by my colleague Rick Schilling in front of the castle. This is euphorbia ruby glow, which has, it's a little daintier. Uh, you know, Rick, Rick is a little more conservative than, than I am. I go for the big and buxom and he goes for more, more reserved. But if you look closely, 
what you're seeing there is a modified leaf, just like a poinsettia bract. It's not an, the actual flower, that's a modified leaf. And the flower is this tiny little thing in the middle. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that euphorbias are pollinated by bee, uh, not bees, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they're pollinated by flies. Um, so don't be disgusted by that, but uh, they're, they're just absolutely wonderful. So full sun, well-drained soils, um, and for, and there, there's another close-up of the bract. And you see here, that is a seed pod, this little round thing. And the one thing to know about wolfinii, Euphorbia wolfinii, uh, it does produce viable seed. And the seed distribution method on Euphorbia is the seed will literally explode to, to spread the seed, which is so awesome. I mean, Mother Nature, the way, the way these, these mechanisms to spread the seed and regenerate yourself, so amazing. However, with just knowing, knowing that the seed will, will explode like that is important to know because if you want to want more in your garden and you just want them to go loosey goosey, go ahead, let the seeds explode and you'll have them uh, quite a few. However, you will have a garden with a lot of euphorbias. So what I do before the seed is ripe, I go in and I cut those, the entire stem back of the euphorbia. Um, and um, that's my maintenance for the year. And I'll cut that stem down deep into the core of the plant so that when the new growth starts, it starts from the center instead of way out on the stem. And if I want more euphorbias, I'll save some of those seeds. I'll let one, one head, um, mature with with seed but i often will put like a brown paper bag over it to collect the seed when they explode so i can place them where i want to um one one note on euphorbia is that uh, the it does have a white sap and some people are allergic when the sun and the sap uh meet uh, some people will have an allergic reaction. So wear gloves, don't rub your eyes, be a little cautious that one time of the year when you go in and do some maintenance. But for me, Euphorbia wolfinii is an evergreen, so, or ever blue. Uh, uh, so even in the winter, it looks phenomenal. Uh, it's just, it's one of my favorite plants. Just, just beautiful. So moving moving on and i'm i'm running through these very rapidly um and i know there's so many details in each plant group but i just want you to explore the plant families uh epimediums uh i can't even remember what the latin uh the common name is barren wart i think which means nothing to me uh they are absolutely wonderful shade ground covers. Uh, many of them, the foliage will be evergreen. So you have this, you know, it's only about eight inches from the ground, six to eight inches, somewhere in that. The, the foliage um, slowly um, enlarging ground cover, like a clump former. Some some cultivars, like this is sulfurium, it is a faster grower than others. Uh, it's in bloom right now out in the garden. So early spring, my maintenance, the one thing I do uh, every year is before it blooms, if the foliage is looking tatty or nasty from the winter, I'll shear it off to the ground. And that way, when the flowers come up, they're visible above. Well, they're not diminished by the, the nasty looking foliage. That's the maintenance for the year. I mean, these are the kind of plants that I depend on to carry on and, and look good without my attention. Um, I'm off fussing with something else. Uh, these are not divas. These are proven performers. Um, 
There are so many new ones out there right now. Uh, Dark Beauty on the left is more of a uh, sweet little clump former with these burgundy foliage, the burgundy flowers and the, the new foliage is burgundy too. So you get that double whammy. Warly Ents is an oldie, but a goodie. It's got orange flowers on it. Uh, some of the new, new species. Um, we've, we had a plant collector doing a lot of work in Asia, uh, Daryl Propes, bringing back amazing species of epimediums. Um, and Fargesia is one that he brought back just amazing. Uh, yes, that is a red mustard uh, behind it. You can have your veg in the garden too. Uh, oh, pink champagne. Oh, oh, come on. Look at this baby. Uh, the, the bubbly flowers are about uh, a foot high. And uh, just these pink little magical bubbles hanging above the foliage and the speckling of the foliage just adds one more bit of, of interest. This one is perfectly evergreen for us in, in Washington, DC. Um, it's just, just a gem. Um, look around for some of these. They are fabulous. Here is pink champagne in the garden. This was taken last year. Um, and it just is a standout. They might be a little expensive to buy your first bit, but they will grow relatively rapid, rapidly if you give them good garden soil. I mean, just like all of us. I mean, we grow better when we're in a good, happy, happy home. So rich organic soil, dappled shade, thicken. In, in other climates, I've seen them growing in full sun, but really they'd be happier in a little dappled sun and uh, they'll, they'll just uh, perform like crazy for you. So what else? Oh, Domino. Oh, you know, I think I threw in some extra epimediums because I'm so enamored with them. Uh, I mean, just as a great uh, plant blooming in the early spring, uh, complimenting all your tulips and things like that. They're, they're just fantastic. So anyway, oh, and some more. <laughs> all right, another plant group I absolutely love. This is a Native American Baptisia. And the plant we're looking at is right in there. That's Baptisia purple smoke. So you see the time of the year is April. Uh, that's that's what's happening out in the garden right now, um, or the tulips and things. This was taken last year. So baptisias should be shooting up and getting ready to bloom. And when they unfurl, oh, lovely, lovely blue flowers is, is one of our natives. Um, and it is in the pea family. So it is a true legume. So it creates its own nitrogen and fixes its own nitrogen. But um, there have been a lot of, you know, the resurgence and the, the embracing, finally, of our native plants. Um, uh, Baptisias have really come into the fold. Uh, my friend Tony Avent down in Raleigh, North Carolina, calls them redneck lupins. Um, because in our heat and humidity in DC and further south of us, you can't grow a lupin. I mean, we all, except in the Texas lupins, which is a totally separate thing. But most of those British big lupins that we, we see on TV, it's like, we can't grow those. They, they melt. However, baptisias are a great alternative. But our native species often are quite good size. Like this purple smoke, um, a selection, it was one of the earliest selections made of Baptisia australis. This guy in blue topped out about, well, I'm five foot four and it was above my head in blue. Uh, it was a big, beefy, uh, easily five feet tall in bloom by about three feet three to four feet wide. 
uh, that takes up a lot of garden space. But the breeders have really been working on shrinking that down a little bit and playing with the colors. So the, tr the uh, false indigo was the name that for the plant family, it was given because the blue was used to, to make indigo dye for a while until they found a better source. Uh, and I don't know why that picture is there again. Uh, let me keep going. Oops. Why? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, the breeders have been playing around and coming up with new strains. Like this is lemon meringue. Uh, and it's up on a hill, so it looks much bigger. But it, it's only about three and a half feet tall by two feet wide. Uh, this is the work of Hans Hansen. Uh, and here's a species. This is at my home. This is Baptisia sparacephalon, uh, screaming yellow. And it is a screaming yellow, but it is so beautiful. Blue gray foliage, uh, golden yellow flowers on, on top. Comes true from seed. Um, so you, you can collect seed. And this is what the seed pod you would look for. And when these these dry, they'll be black and the, they'll rattle like a baby's rattle. And I, I read somewhere that some Native Americans use this as a baby rattle for their children. I don't know if that's true or not. But what does happen in, in the wild, these are like tumbleweeds in the fall the entire plant will just sort of cleave off from the ground. And as the wind blows, the whole plant rolls like a tumbleweed. And as it hits the ground, it's dispensing those seeds. So again, nature is so cool on how they move, move the seed around. But uh, a little bit of care and culture for a baptisia, it wants full sun. This baby is coming from the Midwest prairies uh, all the way down into Texas. Some of the, the white forms are down in Texas. Uh, full, full sun, good soil. It really, a clay soil it will adapt to, but it, it prefers more organic soil. But the one thing to know, Baptisias put roots down. They get settled in. So plant them where you want them. Don't, don't expect to, to plant it in an area and then dig it up and move it once it gets more established. Um, they really, really resent being moved and uh, your back will thank you for planting it in the right place to begin with. Uh, they will be small when you purchase them in a container. They, they just, they look like a, a tiny little spindly thing. Uh, but no, they will grow and they'll, they're worth it. So they get better with age. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Amsonia, Amsonia hubrechtii, another Native American plant. Uh, this one, it uh, blooms in early spring. And this is another plant that you want to plant it where it will, you want it to be. Do not try and move these. Tap root. Oh, I've broken numerous shovels trying to move these. Shovels and axes are required. Anyway, uh, Amsonia hubrechtii. It blooms in early spring. Uh, Texas blue star is one of the common names. You know, the flower, I, you know, it's nice, but it it doesn't stop me in the trap my tracks or anything like that. What stops me in the tracks are this foliage. This, this foliage is so sexy and seductive. I mean, it, it's, it's a plant that just touch me, touch me, touch. And sorry, I'm getting all excited and hot and heavy over this plant, but it is so um, deliriously wonderful to touch. And not only, does it look beautiful all summer, that lovely green, the touchy, 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 but in the fall, like as the trees are changing color, this baby, as you see this picture, 
turns golden yellow. And it's not a flash in the pan. It stays this color for weeks into the fall uh, before mother nature knocks it down and the stems will just fall to the ground. Just a wonderful, wonderful plant. Uh, slow growing, slow to get some bulk to it. Uh, but once it, it bulks up, you'll have it for for a long, long time. It was the perennial plant of the year a couple of years ago uh, for very good reason. So full sun, well-drained soils. Uh, I use the foliage as a cut flower also. It adds, adds texture, just, just a love. Uh, this was the work of my friend Chuck Hinkle up at Swarthmore College or um, yeah, at the Scott Arboretum. Uh, sorry, the pictures, pictures cruddy, but he used it as a mass planting, like a hedgerow. So you'd walk, or at least I was always, I would walk by and I would have to touch it. It was just, yeah, reach out and touch it. So great plant. Uh, here it is. This Notice the picture was taken in January. This is in DC but still January. So it holds on to its the foliage late. Uh, and then uh, in early spring, I will go in and cut the, the stems back. And then I break them up and leave them on the ground for birds for nesting. Uh, just a wonderful plant. Sometimes it will self sow. Um, rogue those babies out when they're small, when you see them or pot them up and share with, with neighbors. It's a really good plant. Okay, uh, another one, and I never thought I would include orchids on my, my, uh, my top 10 or top 15 plant list, but Blatilla striata, it's an Asian, uh, Asian orchid. And here it is, this is, this is about what it's looking like out in the garden right now. This is a tulip clusiana coming up through it, but the plant we're looking at is right here. The pleated foliage uh, surrounding the flower buds as they come up. Just beautiful. And a couple of weeks later, there it is in full bloom. And it seems to keep blooming uh, a month, month and a half. Uh, you know, I'm really bad about specifics on how long a plant blooms. Um, maybe I'm just moving around way too fast and I don't, I don't, I often don't know what day of the week it is in the spring, let alone how long something's in bloom. But it is a beauty. Um, average soil, dappled shade, uh, and it just gets better and better. And here it is when it's out of bloom. And you notice the wide pleated foliage, very elegant uh, cascading over. And then even the seed pods are these beautiful little, little dainty things that hang on there. And then during the winter, here it is. And again, I'm not the best photographer, so sorry about the, the picture. The dried seed capsules still giving interest and on the ground, the pleated foliage that is there. Again, I, I leave as much as I can on the ground for the birds to nest with. Um, and they have picked this clean. They seem to like it. I uh, cut it up in smaller bits for them. So Blatilla striata, uh, just a lovely Asian native uh, orchid, but plays well with others. Uh, my maintenance for it, once a year, I cut it to the ground, those, those stalks, and that's it. I mean, these are the kind of, I mean, I'm basically a lazy gardener. Uh, I do not like divas in the garden, those that I have to fuss over. Um, so I rely on things like Blatilla to uh, give a lot of interest. All right, and, and you might be surprised seeing Yucca in my list of top plants. Uh, yuccas get a bad rap because they're so overused, but that's usually because they're poorly used. Uh, 
This is the yucca I grew up with in Indiana, yucca filamentosa. And you, you see where the name comes from, that those filaments on the side. It's, um, it's a really great full sun, hot and dry plant. When it blooms, it is exquisite. I mean, those flower stalks are up to eight feet tall and very fragrant flowers, just a gem. Um, and with age, it sends up side pups. Uh, the parent plant, once it blooms, the, that individual will uh, pass on usually, but it sends up side shoots. So it, it's self-regenerating, really, really cool. Uh, and here is Yucca Color Guard. This is uh, the work of one of my colleagues over in the Hershorn Museum. This is Sarah's work. Uh, beautiful accent um really that foliage plant just the structure and color and form it really um just grounds the entire display uh yucca color guard is a great plant full sun hot and dry um if there are people that cut through your garden beds uh, yucca is a good plant to plant there defensively to kind of tell them don't don't walk through here. Uh, and then even during the winter, on color guard, the colors intensify as the temperatures drop. Again, adding structure and form even during the slower seasons. Really a great plant. And look into other members of the yucca family. Uh, this is yucca rostrata. I love yucca rostrata. And, you know, if you come down to the garden, you'll see I, I planted quite a few of them. They were small little babies when I got them. They were uh, like three gallon containers. And now they're, they're taller and, and wider than me. Um, but they're just awesome. Uh, every single month of the year, they look great. And they just continue to put on a, a great show with wonderful texture. So look into to yuccas. Uh, they're just great plants. And uh, yep, I think my next plant is right here in front. Uh, this is Salvia Berggarten. Salvia officinalis, which is the salvia that, that is used for cooking. It's um, the cooking sage. Uh, but this selection, Salvia bird garden, has much wider foliage. Uh, that foliage is about, I don't know, two and a half to three inches across by four inches long. Uh, it's just a really beautiful silvery gray mounding habit uh, that's maybe a foot and a half tall by two feet wide. Um, I've let it get a little little wider, but you control that with your pruners. Um, so it's just a lovely thing. I've never seen it bloom. It's really grown for the foliage. And again, being silvery gray, it wants full sun, uh, well-drained soil, hot and dry location. A lovely, lovely addition. Look at that. It's felty, it's fuzzy, it wants you to touch it. And then you could cook with it too. So what, perfect, evergreen for me. Allium millennium. Ooh. Allium uh, millennium uh, was, well, it was supposed to be introduced in 2000, but it it uh, sort of missed the mark a little bit. Uh, it was introduced in 2001. Uh, this was the plant of the year a few years back. It is an ornamental onion. Uh, but if, if any of you have grown chives, which is a blooming machine, However, it also produced seed like a blooming machine and you will have a garden only of chives. Uh, Allium millennium is pretty much sterile. There have been a few seedlings, but for the most part, it is a sterile plant that just, it's, um, 
eight to 10 inches tall, little, little bubbles of uh, champagne bubbles of flowers on the top that the bees absolutely adore. Uh, it, it does have like a rhizom rhizomatous root system. So not a bulb, but you can easily divide it and spread it that way. Um, very, very sweet plant, wonderful. Uh, there are lots of new ones on the market also. Uh, other, other cultivars that are also sterile. And here it is with the foliage uh, in early spring. This must have been last year with the fritillarias in bloom. Uh, so it would be probably March, I mean, um, early April. And um, I do have a rabbit in the, in the Ripley garden, a very well fed one. Um, and I have noticed that he or she uh, seems to really like the allium. Um, so wonderful plant, um, maintenance on it, uh, pretty, pretty minimal. It dies to the ground and comes back up in the spring and I do nothing. I don't, well, I might deadhead a little bit uh, after it's finished blooming, just, just because I'm a little meticulous that way, um, but it is not necessary. Here it is in the garden uh, with some larkspur and coneflowers and verbena bonariensis and santalina. It's just a, a really good um, long blooming perennial uh, that just is a really nice uh, partner with other perennials. There, here it is used over at American History very nicely by other colleagues of mine, mixed in with Nacella tenuissima. So that, that feather reed grass um, or ponytail grass and the allium, perfect, perfect match. Full sun, uh, well-drained soils. Here it is ag again next to one of my other favorite plants. This is Calamentha uh, right beside it. And it is the current perennial plant of the year. And for good reason, it is a blooming machine. Uh, look for the cultivar white cloud or Montrose white. And let's see if this works for months during the summer. This thing is just moving. The whole plant will be buzzing with honeybees and little, little hover bees and all kinds of things, nectaring on this. It is not a native, but it is providing so much food for our native bees. Uh, it is just an absolute delight. The, the foliage, as you see, is tiny and minty, uh, but don't let the word mint scare you. It does not spread and take over the neighborhood by runners. It's a clump former. Uh, and if you run your hand over it, you get this minty fragrance. Um, what else can I say about it? At the end of the season, uh, you have these brown stems that are there that during the winter, oops, I didn't mean to start that again. Uh, during, during the winter, uh, those little brown stems stay upright and they catch the snow like, like little fairy caps. Um, and in the spring, I just cut it to the ground and break up the stems and leave them on the ground for again, uh, return to the earth and nesting material. So Calamantha, white cloud, um, there is, uh, a calamantha on the market that has fuzzy foliage uh, that will self sow like crazy. So you want a calamantha that uh, feel the foliage. Uh, and if it's got a lot of fuzz on it, pass on that one and look for the cultivar white cloud or Montrose white. So anyway, great, great plant. And we're, we're getting near the end of, of the season, like the calamanthas are blooming in the middle of the summer, same with the alliums. And to extend the season out, 
the hearty chrysanthemums, not those chrysanthemums you, you, you know, that are sold in the fall, those little gump, gumpo things, hearty chrysanthemums. Uh, Jessamine Moonlight is one of my absolute favorite, favorite plants. This pale, pale lemon yellow. Uh, this is probably in November. It's starting to bloom. Uh, this is even later because uh, the, the fountain is decorated for Christmas and I don't do that. And, well, I never get around to it until uh, uh, it's probably sometime in December. And this, this baby is still blooming. And I'm sorry, my pronunciation is always wrong on this plant name, but it is it is absolutely a glorious one. And there are many other hardy chrysanthemums that also bloom very, very late. Uh, maintenance on it, uh, you want to give it a hack back, you know, like cut it back by half before 4th of July. And that'll give a denser plant. It might delay blooming for a week or two, but it won't be as tall and leggy. Um, most chrysanthemums will spread and cover some some territory, um, but all you have to do is, uh, you know, chop off anything extra and share with your neighbors. Uh, so it's a great, great plant. And I would be remiss if I did not include grasses with in the garden. Uh, Hakanakloa macro areola is uh, Japanese Hakoni grass. Here it is here. And the reason why I love grasses is, is they add texture and, and just movement. And, and with the Hakoni grass, even color. Um, this is a shade lover or partial shade lover. So, you know, most perennials in the shade will bloom in the early spring. And the rest of the summer is pretty much just the foliage. So the Hakoni grass really helps brighten a shady condition and add interest. Uh, so here's Hakanakloa macro areola. And there's one of our epimediums there also. Um, just a lovely plant. Uh, it does come, the straight species would be solid green. And there is a, a solid gold form, which I find a little harder to grow, or maybe I just haven't found the right place for it. It likes uh, moist organic soil uh, versus Hakanakloa macro areola, the golden form or the, the variegated form. Uh, I'm growing this under American Elms. So dry, root infested, um, you know, it takes it a little bit to get established, but once it's established, it's very happy. Uh, and here it is during the winter. It turns this tawny golden color during the winter. And I leave it up all winter to add more interest. It adds a little sound and movement also when the wind blows through it. And then I just cut it down to the ground. I use a machete and cut it down to the ground in early spring. Uh, before the bulbs come up. Here it is in the winter. I mean, isn't that so much better than just bare ground? Uh, and the texture when it's frozen, oh, so cool. Yeah, and I guess I don't have a, a, a picture. I didn't include it. Uh, I pair this often with many species tulips, the little Clusianas. So uh, it's cut back. The tulips come up, they're blooming as the new growth of the Hakanakloa starts coming up. So, so you have that variegated foliage coming up with your tulips. Um, you know, they, they have to duke it out a little bit, but they usually uh, work it out. So another grass-like plant that I really love, Carex. Carex, um, there, we have lots of, of native Carex and we have a lot of Asian uh, Carex. Uh, some of the cultivars are just glorious. Carex everillo is this golden yellow color Everest with the green and white and Oshimensis over here on the right hand side. Uh, can't remember the cultivar in, 
and my little box, my face is over the name, but whatever, whichever one you choose, they're all wonderful. Uh, they're happiest with a little moisture, um, but they, again, can handle drier conditions. Uh, here's Everillo in the middle of the summer or late summer, because the gentians are in bloom. Uh, but my new love, <laughs> and yeah, I do go through my lust of plants. Uh, this is Carex Feather Falls. Uh, oh, oh my God, it is such a strong grower. Uh, it, long, long tendrils of flowers that hang down. I guess tendrils isn't the right word, but but the foliage hanging down, just lovely. Uh, the first year I had this, I left it out in a container in the garden, and we had a, a, a relatively uh, mild winter, but still it was in a container, exposed, not a brown tip on it. The thing looked glorious. And you can tell in this picture, that is a beefcake. This is a strongly growing plant. Um, looks wonderful in containers or in the ground. Uh, I have it both places. So anyway, that was a whirlwind trip through some of my favorite plants. Uh, but I invite you down to see the plants in the in the garden. Uh, if you're local, please come down. The Ripley Garden is open 24 hours a day. Just mask up and come on down. Um, I try and label everything in the garden so that you can learn. Uh, we here at Smithsonian Gardens were accredited as a museum also. So the learning happens both out in our garden spaces and in those things called museums, which I rarely step into, but uh, come on down. Uh, I'd love to share the garden with you in person, but if you can't make it in person, visit your local gardens and garden centers. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the garden someday. Hope this was helpful. Be well. Janet. Cindy. You've got to be more enthusiastic. I well, just can't take your sedation. <laughs> <laughs> no. So sorry. Plants are so awesome. I, I really, agree. I am so fortunate. I get it, get paid to play in the dirt. I, yeah. I am very blessed. Well, want, we'll answer a couple questions. Why don't okay. you go ahead and stop sharing screen so they can see us. Okay. Uh, you, I don't need to see me. Um, but we have a couple questions to ask you. Uh, one do you fertilize the perennials in your garden? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, yeah, okay. And I answered. I answered for you. And I said, usually you don't fertilize heavily. Um, so correct me. Right. I, I don't fertilize heavily, but I do, um, I do use organic fertilizer um, and uh, try and feed the soil organically. Mm -hmm. So um, yes. Organic. Okay. I, and I do know if you over fertilize, you're going to make those lovely things flop. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They're actually happier if they are grown a little lean. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the soil is too rich, especially in our heat and humidity in DC, mm -hmm. uh, they'll be going gangbusters in early spring and then the heat comes in and they just sort of flop over. So, exactly. uh, go easy on fertilizer. Yeah. How about annuals and, and containers? Do you up it a little bit more for those? <laughs> <laughs> uh, our greenhouse growers are always amazed when they get my list. Um, you know, I, again, I'm so spoiled. We have greenhouse growers that I give my list to of plants that I want in the garden the following season, and they grow them for me. I mean, come on. I, it doesn't get better than that. Um, yeah. They're always amazed that, I mean, the Ripley Garden is only a third of an acre. I cram so many plants. In there. <laughs> I've seen the shoehorn. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Literally, I'm walking through the garden going, okay, where, where can, where can this go? Where can this go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Don't try that at home, by yeah. the way. My plants are very social. Yes. They have they to are. be. Um, 
How about someone asked, and I recognized it as a geranium, but I didn't know the species, the lovely little hardy geranium underneath the blotilla, the shot for the winter. Yeah. What, what's this species or a cultivar? Cantabrigens St. Olga. St. Olga. Okay. Yeah. What color, a pink or it's, a lavender? It's like a, um, it's, almost, it's a pale white pale pink to white it's she it depends on what color is with her what color comes out but okay. pale pink i would say yeah it's a wonderful ground Pretty cover sweet. i have many and i know you have many different hardy geraniums in the garden so mm -hmm. they're they're yeah. lovely to include um so there, I just saw another one pop up. The peonies, what do you uh, work around? Okay, what do you plant near peonies for fall winter interest and to hide any bald spots when they die back in the fall? Oh, well, um, next to one of my peonies, I have a wonderful fall, fall blooming chrysanthemum. Um, other peonies, oh my gosh, what do I have next to them? Uh, Next to Bartzella, oh, oh, it changes every year. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on that right now. Um, but the main main thing is, um, when you're going to a garden center, and it's so easy to have a good spring garden. It, it's it's easy everything looks mm -hmm. fresh and clean and and but think about all four seasons and think about evergreens like mm -hmm. like that wonderful um salvia bird garden is an evergreen you could put that right next to your peonies and and that looks really really good when your peonies start looking mm, not so good mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And you didn't show Lily of the Valley, but no. uh, uh, yeah, I, I have it in mind because, enough. oh, I had to. But the the person that's asking the question is, how do you keep it in check? And she's right. Uh, you do some of the plants that we grow. You have to be a little bit firm with them. And I've seen you do it too. Get in there with that shovel and chunk things out and just say, yeah. Give it to someone else yeah. and do that. So it is work. There's a reason uh, we're professionals and <laughs> we can get yeah. a job and work all the time because yeah. there's that much work always. Yeah. The Ripley Garden is not a low maintenance garden. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there might, I rely on a lot of plants that don't need a lot of attention, but because there are so many plants in there, <laughs> um, it, my days are full filled and it is a full-time job and i so look forward to having my volunteers back this year to help help with the load we're excited paula is working yeah. on that as we speak uh so that's great to be able to do that so um, again uh, asking about fertilizers when when do you fertilize when do you put uh your wonderful organic fertilizer down okay um bulbs do it when they're in active growth so all your narcissus and hyacinths and, and tulips and things like that, if you want them to come back next year, feed them now and leave that foliage up because the foliage is like a solar collector, gathering energy, putting back in the bulb, which is basically a lunchbox that needs to be refilled. Um, other, other plants, um, early spring, I'll go through and do like a light dusting of fertilizer through. Um, and if I'm doing a new planting, I'll incorporate the fertilizer into the soil. But okay. com compost, add compost and leaf mold and leave your leaves, leave your leaves. Mm -hmm. That's mother nature's plant food right there. Just leave them to decay on the ground. The, the birds and insects will thank you for leaving them and your plants will thank you also. Agreed. And also, you never know who's hitchhiking on those. Yeah, exactly. Some wonderful native insects are overwintering in those yeah. pieces. So, yeah, that's a good uh, way to do it. So, we've been asked to repeat the geranium name again. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And also, they are hardy geraniums. And correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Ger geranium cantabrigens. C A N T A N B R I G I E N S E, Cantabrigens, and that is Saint Olga. Okay. Uh, 
And there's so many wonderful oh hardy geraniums. Yeah. yeah, you can yeah. go crazy. And our, our native uh, maculatums are in bloom right now, but they're not evergreen. Mm -hmm. Cantabrigans is an evergreen for me. Yes, for me as well. But the, the native geranium, I love it when it turns that burgundy color in the fall. So yeah, they all of them have great characteristics to be able to add to a garden. Um, I'm looking again. I'm trying to read as fast as so if you see my Sarah, eyes go back and forth, I'm getting yeah. dizzy. <laughs> Sarah is saying our time is up. Oh, it is one o'clock. Well, gosh, we've had so much fun. I haven't even been paying attention to the clock at all. So I want to thank you, Janet, for your enthusiasm and your wealth of knowledge. And I want to thank you, our audience, who who we are doing this for. We want you to learn and emulate and prolificate and <laughs> appreciate. Well, not them, the plants. I yeah. will say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go plant something. Yeah, exactly. So enjoy this beautiful time period. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week with a special uh, guest who's going to be talking about spring ephemerals. And Ooh. this is your only shot because they're going to disappear. That's why they're ephemerals. So come and learn a bit more about spring ephemerals. Thank you all so very much. See you next week. Bye. Bye all.